Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, this is going to be a long study, so we're going to try to get through it. When it rains and it gets cloudy here at this time of the year, it gets cold. I'm sitting here trying to pray with the Lord and kind of touching up this study and started shaking and realized how cold it was getting. So we got rain here, praise the Lord. Um, been doing a lot of work out in the backyard. Uh, sorry I haven't been getting out videos as often as I normally do. But we're on part five, okay? Can a Christian be carnally minded? CCBCM. I want to shorten it so I can do other titles. So, this study we're going to be talking about the other half of First Corinthians chapter one. Okay. The whole point of these studies, I'll go ahead and read it real quick. The title of this one is called "Glory or Shame." Okay. Uh, Romans eight one. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Remember, we're created in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, capital S. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not, su for it is not subject to the law of God. What's the law of God? What Jesus Christ did on the cross. True biblical salvation. Uh, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. You can't be carnally minded and walk after the flesh and be saved. It's not works that I'm teaching. It's called, it's, that's your lost state. You don't get saved and remain in your lost state. Okay. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, capital S. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The whole point of this study is, is people like to run to 1st and 2nd Corinthians and say, carnal Christian, carnal Christian, you can live a carnal life as a Christian and you can still be saved and go to heaven and everything. It's all about justifying the flesh. And I threw this question at them, and in the comment section I've yet to get anybody to refute this. It's not about can you have sin in your life and be a Christian, they try to say carnal. It's about can you be carnally minded and walk after the flesh and be a Christian. Is that the marks of a true Christian, or is that the marks of a false convert? So when we got the first half of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it was talking about how people are worshiping men. They're holding men above the Word of God. They're holding men above Jesus Christ. You're getting people, and as we see in this study, they're starting to glorify the wisdom of men, and they glorify men, the strength of men, because it's all about the flesh, elevating the flesh. Okay? Justifying sin, pleasing your flesh. So let's go ahead and get started. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Right. I am here. Uh, we're going to do 18 through 25. Now I won't be turning as much. I'm a King James Bible believer. So make sure you have your King James Bibles out. Make sure you're pausing the video and turning to all the scriptures and following along. Sometimes I get really going and these things get really long. So I just try to go through it, and I'll have the scriptures out for the main chapter that we're doing, but when we jump around the Bible, turn, pause the video and turn to them. Make sure I'm telling the truth, and make sure you're going through and reading the Word of God with me. Okay. Remember, the Word of God is supposed to be read, heard, and spoken. Not necessarily all three at the same time, but one of those three God will let you do. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to 25. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Okay? We preach the true gospel, and you have people that reject Jesus straight out, and you have people that have their flesh gospel. The gospel that allows them to elevate the flesh, glorify the flesh, and justify sin. Okay? The true gospel, the preaching of the cross to them that perish, is foolishness. Okay. 
but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Okay? We're going to get to that verse about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay. You've got people that in their wisdom, they're trying to find a way to justify their flesh and keep their flesh. You have lost people that are very spiritual. They reject Jesus Christ and they want to be spiritual. There's a way that they can become gods one day. And you have the atheists that try to explain away God, the religion of atheism. And they try to justify their flesh by explaining God away. You can be spiritual and live however you want. You can be gods. I'm getting ahead of myself. You can be gods knowing good and evil. Okay? So to them it's foolishness. What it said there in verse, uh, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. Well, God's going to use that so-called foolishness to preach to save them that believe. Praise the Lord, God saved me. Through the so-called foolishness of the gospel. Okay? To them that perish it's foolishness. To us it's the power of God. We understand the power of the gospel. 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Stumbling block unto the Jews. Why? Because the Jews, um, the laws and everything, but if you saw the time period when Jesus, or read the time period when Jesus was here, they were using the traditions of men, they were using all this stuff to justify their sin. You have the carnal ordinances. Remember, I said in the book of Hebrews, and a couple times in the Old Testament, it uses the word carnal, but it's talking about the carnal ordinances. Okay? I can just take my turtle doves, give my sacrifice, and my sins washed, I'm, I'm forgiven, so now I can go back out and do it again. So why is the preaching of the cross a stumbling block for the, for the Jews? They require a sign. And they use that to try to get away with sin. I need a sign. Well, there's no sign. I must be doing okay. Remember, God didn't talk and have any conversation with the Jewish people for, four, I think, a little over 400 years before Jesus came. And became in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, oh, I, I must be doing good. There's no signs telling me I'm doing bad. Give me a sign that I'm supposed to do this. Give me a sign I'm not supposed to do that. See what I'm saying? They wanted signs. Okay, okay after the Greek, foolishness. Okay. Uh, it's foolishness to the Greeks because, they, like I said, you look all throughout the world, it's all about trying to find a way to explain away God or bring Jesus down so you can justify your flesh. You can live however you want. Okay. That's why unto the Greeks it's foolishness preaching the gospel, the true gospel. 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Uh, I want to make sure I don't go too far, far. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Remember the two contrasts there, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God, and he's the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ. And it says here, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. We're going to find out real quick, okay, the wisdom of men versus the wisdom of God. So that's where we're going to get to. Paul's view of man's wisdom. Philippians 3, 1, if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Okay. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Okay. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Okay, I want to stop there. Remember, uh, Corinthians, we're going to get to that verse where there's preaching. You have all these wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, and all these false converts. Remember, the sow or the dog returned to his own vomit. Beware of dogs. 
and Sal return to her wallowing in the mire. Beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The circumcision made without hands. Though I might also have confidence, remember it says have no confidence in the flesh. The strength of us, the flesh, is, is too weak. Okay, He doesn't have confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss for Christ. Okay. Like I was talking about, he was blameless because he was doing all the laws, the sacrifices, but they were using, a lot of people were using that to get away with sin. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, created in Christ Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Remember the law of God, the power of the law of God. And the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of His dead, of the dead. What is Paul saying? All the things I've done in the flesh, good works, my own wisdom, my strength in the flesh, and my wisdom is all but dumb. It's worthless. You've got to come to that broken state at the cross that I am worthless. There's nothing about me that's good. There's none righteous, no, not one. Okay. So, that's Paul's attitude towards the wisdom of man. There's probably other verses, but I'm trying to push through this. I see the scribes and the Pharisees, how did they use wisdom of man for the flesh? And did they, were they able to fool Jesus Christ? No. So if you want to turn to Matthew 15, verse 1. Okay. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why did thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Okay. Traditions. A lot of people today try to use traditions, basically man's wisdom, to overthrow the Bible. To overthrow God's Word. Why? Because oftentimes the traditions of men are fleshly. It's all about the flesh. It's a way to try to justify the flesh. So they're using their wisdom. They come up with their traditions, man's wisdom. See what Jesus says. Verse 3. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? God's wisdom. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest to profit by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus hath he made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. They're trying to overthrow the word of God. God's wisdom with man's wisdom. And they were getting a profit for it. The flesh. Man's wisdom, when you look at man's wisdom, and I'm not talking about someone learning how to do, do something work-wise with your hands better. I'm talking about when it comes to God, when it comes to salvation, as we're reading, uh, the, um, for the preaching of them, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. When it comes to salvation, okay, the wisdom of man is all about justifying the flesh. As we saw here with the, scri uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, it's about money in their pocket. So if you pay me, you know like today with the Catholic Church indulgences, you know, you can pay me and, and I'll forgive your sins. I'll let you go free. It's all about justifying the flesh. So why do people love to correct God's Word? Reject it, correct it. 
ignore, take some verses out, totally mess up the Bible. Why do they do that? Okay. Psalms 119.9. If you want to turn to 119.9. Okay. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You mean it's God's word that gets sent out of our life? Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ gets sent out of our life through His Word. The Holy Spirit opens His book to us. So we got to get rid of it, right? We got to change it with all these Bible perversions. Jump down to one uh, to uh, verse eleven. Sorry, I'll get it out. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. Well, if you don't have God's Word, you can't hide it in your heart. You can justify the flesh. If you mess with God's Word, correct it. It's all about moving stuff around, adding to, subtracting, correcting, changing definition of words. Why? So you can justify your sin. John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Right. What's all about correcting God's Word and using man's wisdom? What's going on in First and Second Corinthians? Men are coming in using men's wisdom. Okay. And men's strength, and they're appealing to people the flesh, because that's what it's all about. So you can live in your flesh, you can live in wicked sin, and you can be a Christian. We'll give you our gospel, it's not the gospel, but we'll give you a gospel that ple uh, pleases your flesh. A Jesus and a gospel that conforms to you. You don't have to conform to Jesus, or the Jesus Christ, the Lord, capital the Lord Jesus Christ, or the gospel. Oh, no, no, no. It conforms to you. Okay. Romans 6.1 Why do they change the word? This is the best example. What shall we say then? Romans 6.1 Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's all about justifying sin. All oh, God's grace, you know, and, and faith alone and, and everything. We're saved by grace alone through faith alone. We'll get to that, okay? These people, we're going to read it real quick. They're coming in and preaching another gospel to the, to the Corinthians. So coming to First and Second Corinthians is the worst thing you can do to try to justify a carnal Christian. Because Romans chapter 8, 7 and 8 disprove it. And you go through here and Paul's disproving it. You're not supposed to be carnal. That's not the marks of a someone who is saved. Okay, carnally minded and walking after the flesh. So why do we have false gospels? We pretty much just explained it. But I want to go into it a little bit. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. If you want to turn there. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, it's not another gospel in the sense that there's many paths to heaven. That's what Paul's saying. It's not another gospel. It's a counterfeit, okay? Um, but it's perverting the gospel of Christ. And that's exactly what these false uh, so-called Christian religions are. Faith alone. It's perverting the gospel of Christ. They take out repentance, confession. You don't even ask. Therefore, you've earned it with your faith. You can continue in sin and live however you want. And you see it in the lives of these people, the fruits of easy believism. And when they say faith alone, I'm learning what they're really saying is belief alone. Not faith alone. Because true, through faith, we've already talked about it. You go through repentance, that's faith. You go through the belief in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's faith. You confess both in prayer. That's faith. And then when you ask God to save you, that's when it's a gift. When He saves you, it's a gift. So, um, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel, he repeats himself. That's how important this is. Unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. All these people teaching false gospels, you can earn salvation with your works. 
You can merit salvation. You can earn salvation with your faith. You can lose salvation. You can get it back. You can lose it. Let them be accursed. 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. This is one we talk about a lot for this study for Corinthians because this is what's going on. You've got men coming in. We'll read it real quick. 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. I would... Um, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, what he's having to go through with these uh, people, false converts, false brethren, truly saved that are messed up. Would to God you could bear with my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste version to Christ. Remember we talked about this. The old husband, the old man, the connection you have between body and soul, it's dead when you get saved. He's dead. You're free to be married to Jesus Christ. And these people, he's coming across Corinthians and seeing people still married to the old man. He's not dead. Okay? I've espoused you to one husband. Right? Now, where did I leave off? Give me a second. Right. To one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, and we're going to get into that, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preach another Jesus, what did we read about Galatians 1.6? They're perverting the gospel of Christ. Preach another Jesus. The Jesus of the King James Bible, the capital L Lord Jesus Christ, still has a zero tolerance for sin. Okay? That's why he pro promotes the changed life. His word promotes the changed life. You're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. All sin is negative. The Jesus of the Bible, all sin is negative. He died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. That's how serious sin is. Sin is serious to the Jesus Christ of the cross. Of the cross. The Jesus Christ of the world. A Jesus Christ. I forgot I need to say it right. A Jesus Christ of the world. He's okay with sin. Oh, not all sin is negative. It's not that big of a deal. Then why do you die on the cross? It's not that big of a deal. So they're coming in, but let's see. By so do your minds be corrupt in simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which we have not received, it's a lowercase s spirit, so it's not the Holy Ghost that they're receiving, or another gospel, preaching of the gospel of them that perish is foolishness. So let's come out with a gospel that people like, a false gospel that's perverted, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Bear with him, Who's that talking about? Satan. So, what's this thing about beguiling Eve? Okay. If you want to turn to Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Remember, we just talked about them trying to get rid of God's word with Bible perversions. Changing God's word, being Bible correctors. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the, every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay. Already she's adding to God's word. God just said don't eat it. He didn't say anything about touching it. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For He just called God a liar. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw, I'll stop there for a second, knowing good and evil, man's wisdom, right? we get to say what's right and wrong, good morals, knowing good and evil, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, here's where the flesh comes in, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Okay? 
uh, bear with Satan, what we read over there, that you might bear with him, that's the serpent beguiled Eve, you're going to wind up in hell if you're following one of these gospels that's perverted. Right? It's that simple. Why do we have a false gospel out there? Not we, the lost world as a whole. Why is there so many false gospels, so many branches of so-called Christianity? Because it's all about the flesh. You want to have hate? You love having hate? Uh, here's our gospel. And here's our religion. Okay? Uh, Stephen Anderson. If you don't know about him, he's, he's some pastor. I forgot where he's at. Somewhere, I think it's Arizona. But he's all about hate. He's all about lies and deception. Okay? He preaches a false gospel. But he teaches what his circle of people their flesh, what they love to hear, and he preaches it. Um, so if you don't, if you want to love your sin and continue in your sin, well, there's Robert Breaker, another so-called man of God. He's not a man of God. He's a man of the flesh. Okay? He called Jesus a liar. Okay, he adds to the Word of God, goes outside the Bible to prove absolute truth that goes against the Bible. Okay. But he preaches a gospel that appeals to people, their flesh, a flesh gospel. Uh, Edward P.F., same thing. People behind the pulpit in these Babel buildings, the same thing. They preach a gospel that appeals to the flesh. And that attracts people because they love their flesh. So, all the false doctrines are offering godhood to people and elevating the flesh. All these false gospels. Okay? The doctrines, too, you look into them, it's kind of, I mean, when you break it down, the false gospels, what's it about? Elevating the flesh and pleasing your flesh. Okay? Um, the Trinity, it's about tearing Jesus down and elevating your flesh. You're either on the equal plane with Jesus or you're better than Jesus. You're smarter than Jesus. Your flesh is stronger than Jesus. Yeah. I mean, you go through it all. It's all about pleasing the flesh. You can, you can be God's knowing good and evil. Why do we have false gospels? So you can have your flesh and claim to be a Christian. We teach the proper plan of salvation. Repentance towards God. I'm talking about true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. We preach the true gospel. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You confess both in prayer, and then you ask God to save you. And we preach that after salvation... The old man is dead. The old husband's dead. You're no longer carnally minded, walking after the flesh. You are now espoused to one husband, Jesus Christ. You're now spiritually minded, walk after the Spirit. You have a changed life. New creature in Christ Jesus. So you're supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin. All sin is negative. You're to take sin seriously. You're to trust the Word of God. And if it says it's a sin, you get it out of your life. Okay, we don't teach a gospel that's okay with sin that elevates the flesh. And these people try to accuse us of works-based salvation because we say you're supposed to have a changed life after salvation. You're supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin. You're supposed to hate evil. You're supposed to hate sin. And these people out there that's part of the faith alone crowd and you have to do good works to merit salvation, you look at their fruits of that false religion, it's all about elevating the flesh. Okay? If you're in one of those camps, as people say, or you've been deceived by one of these Gospels that's been perverted, you need to come to Jesus Christ broken. Okay? True repentance. Okay, Where lost sinners get their wisdom? We're talking about all these false Gospels. Where that elevate the flesh, let you be carnally minded and walk after the flesh. Where do lost sinners get their wisdom? 1 John 4, 5. You want to turn to 1 John 4, 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Carnally minded and walking after the flesh. The world is where the lost people get their wisdom. And these false converts, you can tell that that's where they're getting their wisdom by the life they live. There's no changed life. They're not created in Christ Jesus. Right? They're not spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit. Now where do men 
truly saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women get their wisdom. If we want to turn to James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. When you truly get saved, you get become spiritually minded, and you walk after the Spirit. The Holy Ghost comes in, and what he hears, Jesus is speaking to you through the Holy Spirit and opening this book to you. He starts telling you the do's and the don'ts, what you're supposed to believe, what's absolute truth, what's heresy. He gives you warnings to protect you in this book, his perfect written word. He gives us blessed hope, things to look forward to, things to warn us about the past. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, Faith alone people don't like that. For correction, for instruction in righteousness, they don't like either one of those. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Okay? Where do we as Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women get our wisdom? From God. Okay? Where does the lost world get their wisdom? Our lost world. That answered it. Where do lost sinners get their wisdom? The world. Okay? They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The wisdom of man. Go ahead. Now, let's get into the strength. We talked about the wisdom. Let's get into man's strength versus God's strength. The strength of the flesh, our flesh, versus the strength of Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross. Sin is serious. Matthew 26, 41. This is Jesus speaking. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember we talked about this in Romans 7 and 8. You walk after the flesh, and you're carnally minded, the flesh is in charge. The flesh is weak when it comes to sin. The flesh wants sin. The flesh loves sin. Psalms 39, 5. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man in his best state, well, I'm a good person. I, I do good things. I'm not like those people out there that murder and kill. You know, it's okay to be a sinner uh, as far as carnal. It's okay to be carnal and walk after the world and be sick. Every man in his best state is altogether vanity. Salah. That's the strength of the flesh. Altogether vanity. Romans 8.3 For what the law could not do, this is the good one, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That's how God thinks about sin. That's how Jesus feels about sin. It had to be condemned. He went through what he went through because it was the only way. He would pray saying, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And the reason he prayed that, I don't think, he wasn't praying that because he didn't want to do it. He was praying that for us, because it was written for us, to let us know it was the only way. It was the only way for God to make a way for us to go to heaven. Okay. Condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? The flesh is weak. Jesus Christ is strong. The gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, sin is serious. Sin is going to lead you to hell. Okay? For the wages of sin is death. Okay? The law of sin and death is what you're held accountable to when you're lost. You're not held accountable to the law of God. You're held accountable to the law of sin and death. Okay. John, 6, uh, John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Flesh profiteth nothing. Your flesh is no good. You have to come to that point, that broken state of repentance, when you come to the cross saying, I am no good. O wretched man that I am. Okay. 
I am the chiefest of sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Philippians 4.13 Now where do Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women get their strength? When we get saved and our walk with the Lord, where do we get our strength? Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. When talking about the gospel, we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go down. Uh, the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. True biblical salvation, God has the power. It's God's grace that saves us, period. It's God's grace that saves. How do you find that grace? Through faith. We'll get to that. Okay. I know I said period. There's not a period in that verse. I'm not adding to scripture, but I'm saying it's God's grace that saves. Why some of those? Well, we just found, we're, we're learning why. They love their flesh. I'm like, why, don't, why can't those people understand that? Why won't they just say, God's grace saved me? Because they want to justify their flesh. It's their faith that saved them. Their belief. Only belief. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 2 Samuel 3, 1. I have to show this. You don't have to go back, but it's a comparison. 2 Samuel 3, chapter 3, verse 1. It's a comparison. Saul to King David. The world, because uh, King David is a type of Christ, to Jesus Christ. Okay? Now there was, long, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. The reason I'm throwing this out there, like I said, the two types, the world and Jesus Christ. If you look at the story about Saul and everything, he got into the flesh. It was about the flesh. It was about pleasing men. And he sinned against God. He thought he was good enough to do sacrifices when a Levite's supposed to do it, a priest. He had sinned against God. And his heart was about the flesh and pleasing men, wisdom of the world. He even tried to make excuses for his sin. Okay. And you have King David, a man after God's own heart. God was his strength. God was his wisdom. Jesus came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Yeah, wanted to throw that in there. There's a contrast between the world and Jesus Christ. The world's way is weak. You cannot get to heaven the world's way. You have to do it Jesus' way, God's way. The wisdom of this world is foolishness. God's way is absolute truth. Now, we're going to get to the next part, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.26, where we left off in 1 Corinthians. Okay, We're going to be talking about glorifying man's wisdom and the strength, glorifying man's wisdom and strength, or glorifying God's wisdom and His strength. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. We just talked about that preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. And on fools, we're going to look at this fools for Christ's sake. Confound the wise. And... God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised. I'm despised by these false converts. I'm despised by the lost world that rejects Jesus Christ. Are you? And I'm not being prideful. I'm just saying something to reflect on. We're going to get to a verse here in a second. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are? Why is that? That no flesh should glory in His presence. Your flesh is, when you get truly saved and born again, you're going to be walking after the flesh, uh, spirit, not the flesh, that's lost. Walking after the capital S spirit. You're going to be spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. Your flesh is not going to be glorified in God's presence. That no flesh should glory in His presence. Verse 30, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, we already talked about this, 
and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay, are we supposed to, the contrast of what's going on here in First and Second Corinthians, you have false converts that when you look at them, they're glorifying their own wisdom and they're glorifying their flesh. And we're going to see what that's about, um, these false converts. And then you have truly saved converts, they struggle with the flesh and God will chasten you to get you back on the right track. But you're not glorifying your flesh. When you get called out by the Lord and His Word, or brother and sister in Christ corrects you um, through His Word, okay, you're not going to glorify your flesh and try to justify it and explain it away and try to get away around it. Okay? No flesh, glory in His presence. So, let's look like the glorif glorifying men. Okay, What are people doing when they're glorifying men? Romans 3.23, I think I mentioned this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God. So if you're glorifying men, what are you doing? It's, for, it's because of sin. You love your sin. You're glorifying the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3.21, you want to turn there. Therefore let no man glory in men. Therefore let no man glory in men. I'm sorry, that's uh, 21. We want to start in 18. So, excuse me. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. You know, broken. Fall on your knees before the cross. Come to him broken. Let him become a fool. Preaching the cross is full to those that perish. His foolishness to those that perish. Let me find it again. Oh, because it's back a page. Okay. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Let him become a fool. Okay, that's that he may be wise. You get saved, and the Holy Spirit comes in. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, 20, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Why? Verse 31, or 21, Therefore let no man glory in men. You're not supposed to be glorifying in the flesh. We talked about people trying to glorify men, because those men are telling them what they want to hear. They're helping them elevate their flesh. Now, notice what it says in their own craftiness. And world is foolishness with God, the wisdom of this world. And we that are saved, God shows us in Scripture, and we're able to look at things and go, man, that's so foolishness. Why can't they see that? I'll have to throw this out there. The best example is the Trinity. Okay. They say God the Son, or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three separate persons, in other words, they have to be three separate gods if they're three separate persons, but together they make up one God. And they say, but it's just one God. How many gods are they actually professing? Four. Four gods. That's foolishness. And we that are truly saved look at the scriptures and say, Jesus is the, uh, the scriptures teach that Jesus is the only person of the Godhead. There's only God the Father, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Four times a person's, uh, one of the parts of the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit, is referred to as a person, and it's Jesus Christ. God opens the scriptures to us, and we see it, and he shows us absolute truth, and we look at the world and how they pervert things, and we say, you're foolish. You're so foolish. Okay? Uh, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For his reason, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. We see them for who they are. Okay. And ultimately, if they reject the true Jesus Christ of the Godhead, they're going to wind up in hell. Take him in his own craftiness. Okay. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Remember, the word of God is uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder, and knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. When Jesus was on this earth, he could uh, hear everybody's thoughts and knows everybody's thoughts. 
Therefore let no man glory in men. And that's what we see a lot today in these Babel buildings uh, on YouTube. Uh, when somebody, when their, their man that they worship, they glory in, when he's wrong and he does something really bad, says something really bad, uh, instead of saying, okay, I can, I'm not defending that. What he did was wrong. It's sin. It's wickedness. He's wrong. No, they keep jumping in to defend him. What is that? They're glorifying men. Okay. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, perverting the gospel. And note it says he's weeping. In another part of the Bible, I didn't put this in my notes or anything, where he's uh, not, uh, warning us night and day with tears of the false wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, false converts to mess up the flock. That's messing people up in First and Second Corinthians. Night and day with tears. He's weeping. Okay, often. And now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. How many times are we trying to tell these people that have fallen for the false gospel of only believe, belief alone. They try to say faith alone, but it's belief alone. Okay? We try to witness to them with weeping and with emotion saying, this is the true gospel. I can prove it with scripture. You've been lied to. You're following Satan. These people who believe in works-based salvation, people that are stuck in a, uh, Catholicism, the Catholic Church, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, Charismatics, whatever. We're telling them, hey, these people, these false prophets, these false teachers, they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. They're perverting the gospel. They're elevating your flesh and trying to appeal to your flesh. There doesn't have to be a changed life. Paul knew it. That's what's going on here. What we see here, more than anything, in these last days, in 1 and 2 Corinthians, we see in the world left and right in these last days. That's what we're seeing. 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. There I, where I got the title for the study, Glory or Shame. God is their belly, their flesh. You can be as God's knowing good and evil. Anything to justify the flesh. Whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. We're going to talk about that. Why would you glory in your shame? Why would you glory in not, there doesn't have to be a changed life. Why would you glory in that? Why would you glory in your, sh in your sin? You're supposed to be ashamed of it. Who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven. Where do we get our wisdom? From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies. Body. Sorry. that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, thereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's our attitude, this vile body. Okay. But glory in their shame. Are we supposed to glorify our flesh, our sin? Are we supposed to be glorifying men? Are we supposed to be glorifying God? Okay. Let's get into glorifying God. Okay. Romans 11, 36. When you walk after the flesh and you're carnally minded, you're not glorifying God. And you can't. We read that. You can't please God and it's enmity against God and it's not subject to the law of God. Right? You're not capable of glorifying God when you're lost. Romans 11, 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. We're to give God the glory and everything. Jesus Christ the glory. He created everything. Jesus Christ. Um, for he hath created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We're to give God glory in everything. Revelation 4.11 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory 
there's the glory, and honor and power, for thou hast created all things before thy pleasure, they over and were created. I did put the verse in there. So, um, there's a great old hymn that I love singing and I'm still trying to get it right. And I kind of, you know, you mix verses and um, stands and everything that are in it. But let's see if I can do this. Okay. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Thunder. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. That blessed hope, we hear our names, Philip Newton, come up hither. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Are you giving God the glory? When you're saved, you can, and you're supposed to. If you're doing something you cannot give God glory in, are you supposed to be doing it? I got so much slack when I did the video, um, still playing video games. I mean, I think I've got, I think it was the second video that had the second most comments in the comment section. And, you know, my ministry is is small. I've only been in ministry for a year, so uh, I hardly get any comments. And I got so many comments on that one because I said you can't, and it's truth. You can't glorify God in video games. You can't glorify God in watching Hollywood, Hollywood movies and TV shows. You can't glorify God in uh, alcohol. Okay. Cigarettes, uh, whatever it is that people are trying to justify nowadays. Okay. Dressing immodestly, can't glorify God in that. Okay. So, are you glorifying God or the flesh? Can you give God glory in what you do? Those are things you need to ask yourselves. Can you glorify God in the flesh? No. But you need to look at your life, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the things that are in your life. That's all a part of sanctification. Okay? Can you give God glory in what you do? Okay. And I'm going to throw this up there again. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And yes, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're throwing 10 in there. Okay. For by grace are ye saved. I give God the glory. He saved me. Okay. Through faith. Remember, the through faith... Brother and sister in Christ, um, for godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Right here it says through faith. You want to find God's grace? You go through faith. So when you read, compare scripture with scripture, it says you got to go through repentance to find God's grace. Salvation's always been God's grace. God dealing with man by his grace. Saving man by his grace. So you know that's part of the through faith. Um, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of... Uh, Christ, of almost, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So your belief doesn't save you, okay? It's part of the through faith. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I hope when I said, um, for godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Um, but the confession part is unto salvation. That's part of the through faith. Okay. So, and that not of yourselves. Remember, God gets the glory. No, I'm saved by my faith, faith alone. No, God gets the glory. I'm saved by grace. God's mercy and His grace. Okay. Um, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You are to call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. Why? Because that's how it's not a gift. Uh, that's how it's a gift. They try to say it's not a gift. I almost said it wrong. But that's how it's a gift. You're saying, I don't deserve to be saved, Lord. My repentance didn't save me. My belief, faith alone, didn't save me. My confessing both in prayer didn't save me. My good works can't save me. Only you can save me, Lord. Please have mercy on me, a sinner. Please save me, Lord. It's a gift. It's not of works. 
You didn't earn salvation with your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? You're not earning salvation with your good works. Verse 10, okay? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The changed life. New creature in Christ Jesus. Which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. It's all about, we talked about this, brother and sister Christ, it's all about 100% about the flesh, the world, justifying the flesh, living by the flesh, the flesh is in charge to be in 100% about Jesus Christ. My whole life is about Jesus Christ. I'm busting my butt out there and my back's hurting, my knee's hurting, I'm getting about half a day, sometimes longer and then regretting it. But that whole backyard, it's, it's behind me, <laughs> behind this wall. Um, getting the garden set up, I give God the glory and everything. That whole raised flower bed that I got done and I went through and checked it and it's level. Praise the Lord. I hate leveling. Praise the Lord. You know, getting the bricks, dealing with the dirt, moving stuff. And in the end of the day when I sit and look at what's done, I give God the glory. In your life, as you walk with the Lord, you're to be giving God thanks in all things. Giving God glory in all things. Asking God for things, asking for His help when it comes to sin, with your struggles with sin. Trusting the Lord. Okay? It comes 100% about Jesus Christ because you are created in Christ Jesus and you're going to have good works. God's going to clean up your life. And when God gets sin out of your life, you give God the glory. Don't fall into the trap of saying, yes, I got that sin out of my life, now what? No. God, thank you for getting that sin out of my life. Okay? That's what it's all about, brothers and sisters in Christ, and those that are watching that they've fallen for a perverted gospel. Living a life of Christ is sanctification. God's going to clean up your life. Why would you fight that? Well, let's talk about being ashamed. Remember we talked about there whose glory is their belly, or whose God is their belly, whose glory in their shame. See if I can go, glory is in their shame. Okay? Being ashamed, Mark 8, chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. Why is it that uh, you confess your belief, your repentance and belief before the Lord? To show that you're not ashamed? I think I'm getting ahead of myself. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm getting ahead of myself again. All, right? All that's found in here. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Why do people fight the true gospel? Because they want another Jesus, a Jesus that conforms to them, that they can tear down. The Jesus of the Trinity, tear him down. He conforms to them. The Jesus of this faith alone, which is really belief alone. Okay, You have to earn salvation. You tear Jesus down. You want a Jesus that you can make him conform to you so you can be on equal level in him and you can be his God's knowing good and evil. You love receiving another spirit, the Antichrist spirit, because Jesus, Satan promised, Satan promised, Satan offered Jesus, see all these kingdoms of the world, the world, I will give you this if you worship me. They love that Antichrist spirit because they get to have the world and they end up worshiping Satan as a counterfeit Jesus. And that's why they love another gospel. A gospel that allows them to keep their flesh carnally minded and walk after the flesh. Okay. Romans 10.8 But what saith it? Romans 10.8 But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Thy word have I hid in mine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. A lot of people like to start, stop there. We talked about it, but a lot of people like to stop there. Why do you confess? I've said this, but I want to actually use scripture. It's not my words. 
For the scriptures, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Whose glory is in their shame. Oh, we don't, there's no prayer. It's part of the plan of salvation. Why? Whose glory is their shame? Whose God is their belly? Romans 6, 20. Romans chapter 6, verse 20. For when ye were the servants of sin, were the servants of sin. Your flesh was in charge when you were lost. And a lot of the people out there that are professing to be saved, I pray you get truly saved. That's what I, my desire is. So that you were the servants of sin. even Because right now you are. You were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in that those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You get saved, and now you're ashamed of sin, your lost life, and the way your life is when you first get saved. For the end of those things is death. You're ashamed at your lost life. I don't know how times I look back and said, man, why didn't I get saved sooner? My life was just a mess. I was a wicked sinner, and I still am no good, and I am still a sinner. But where's the, the being ashamed of sin? When you fall into sin, where is the being ashamed and conviction and just feeling miserable? When I get back into sin and I fall into sin and I do something that doesn't please God, I can't give God glory in it, I feel awful. I'm ashamed of my actions. Why are these people out there glorifying their shame? Professing to be saved. Doesn't have to be a changed life. Right? Keep going. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God. There's the contrast again. Servants of sin, servants of God. You go from 100% being about the flesh, 100% about, about being about Jesus Christ. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Fruit had they... The fruit, there's the bad fruit when you're lost, and good fruit when you're saved. Evil fruit when you're lost. Okay. Two. Okay. Romans 1.16. So there we read and learn that we're supposed to have shame now of sin. Be ashamed of the sin in our life and say, Lord, please help me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me is what Jesus said. Repent, forsake Get back to your first love, Jesus Christ and His Word. Living for Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be ashamed every time you drop your cross. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God, remember it talked about the law of God? If you're carnally minded and walking after the flesh, you're not subject to the law of God. And neither can you be. Now, a good example, we're going to end this with a good example of what we see today with this false converts, the professing world, professing Christians. Okay, We're preaching the true gospel, but the world has so many gospels that have been corrupted. Luke 17.11. I did a good stu uh, study on this, the courageous man versus foolish man, but God opened my eyes that we can use this for something else too. Now, as we read this, Keep in mind what we're talking about, the false gospels and everything. People want to be saved and say, I'm a Christian. Okay. Luke 17, verse 11. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, talking about Jesus Christ, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered to, into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Ten men. The number's important. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. I want to be a Christian. I'm using this for what we have today. I want to be a Christian. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show that yourself unto the priest. Okay. They're in the world. People are preaching all these gospels. And we have one gospel. There's only one way to heaven. Not many paths to heaven. One way to heaven. Through Jesus Christ. Through the true plan of salvation. Okay? So all these people are saying, I'm getting saved. Jesus takes, tells them to go to the priest so they can be clean. 
And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Okay? People saying, I got saved, I got saved, I'm born again. Verse 15, and one of them, when they saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Someone who truly gets saved is going to fall on their knees, on their feet, spiritually, um, sometimes physically. I've messed my life up to the point where I'm actually on my knees crying, saying, Lord, save me, I've screwed up. But the life of a Christian, you're going to be on your knees saying, Lord, clean up my life. Lord, I want to glorify you with my life. And the way things are right now, I can't do that. I need your help to get this stuff out of my life, this sin out of my life. I want to give you glory. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Wait a minute. You went out today and you witnessed and hand out gospel tracts and you got people to say the prayer and you got a hundred people saved this weekend. Where's the people coming to give God glory? Where's the evidence of salvation to change life? Only one out of ten? Are we not seeing that today? Sometimes it feels like one out of a million. Giving God glory. Letting God, saying, God changed my life. Went through the true plan of salvation. God changed my life. Oh, no, no. we got to go and try to justify carnality. Being a carnal Christian. Living however you want. That's what all these false gospels are about. But, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger one person and he wasn't even a Jew stranger and he said unto him arise go thy way thy faith hath made thee whole true biblical plan of salvation the true gospel is going to lead to a changed life we are now made whole through Jesus Christ we're part of his body So, the whole point of this study is, are you glorifying your flesh and the wisdom of this world? In other words, you're glorifying your shame. Or, are you glorifying God, His wisdom, His strength, and living your life proving that you're glorifying God. Living your life in a way that you can glorify God. It's not about... Oh, we can be carnal Christians. We can be carnally minded and walk after the flesh. It's about glorifying God. Why would you stand for no changed life? Why would you glory in your shame? My love for you, let's see, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and my love for you in Christ Jesus. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen.